Hi guys. Um, Mr. Paul Kessler was born in Slovakia. Um, he was five years old when Nazi armies entered the country. Um, he and his mother were actually saved and hidden by courageous farmers um, during the Holocaust. Um, and today, Mr. Kessler speaks to teach the lessons of the Holocaust in order to encourage young people to stand against hate and prejudice. It is our privilege to have him on our campus today to share his amazing story. WHS students and guests, let's please show Mr. Kessler our real pride and respect by giving him our undivided attention and warm welcome, Mr. Paul Kessler. And um, after, if you have any papers that you need to be signed, um, they'll be handed out at the back doors. So don't just wait on that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, that introduction. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak here. It's really a privilege. And especially since uh, I have a tie to this community, uh, I married a uh, young lady who grew up uh, on a small farm near Millsap Exit in I-20. And uh, we actually have the farm now, and I get to mow weeds. <laughs> and that's about the extent of my farming knowledge. I was born September of 1939, the month that World War II started when Germany invaded Poland. It was a small village in the very eastern part of what was then Czechoslovakia. It's Slovakia today. Czechoslovakia split into Czech Republic and Slovakia in 1992, about three years after the fall of communism in that part of the world. About 3,500 people lived in that village. Over a thousand were Jews. Jews had lived there since the 1600s. Uh, there was another 5% were gypsies, and the rest were uh, Slovaks, most Slovaks are Catholic. Most people were peasant farmers. It was a pretty primitive place, and uh, probably not too well educated. Now the very first memory that I have, I'm three or four years old, maybe 1942, 1943. And I remember hiding under that bed in our home because some bad people were coming to get us. And in fact, some did. And in 1942, shook my father, grandfather, other members of our family. My father never returned. I don't remember him, I was too young, and we really never knew what had happened to him. In the 1990s, I worked for several years in Prague in the Czech Republic and in Warsaw, Poland. And while in Poland, we went to visit Auschwitz. And I think most of you know that name. It's among the most notorious of the concentration and death camps that existed. Uh, actually, you may know yesterday was the commemoration of 70 years since the liberation of Auschwitz. Over a million people died there. And um, in Auschwitz now, they have a room where you go and they have the archives. Auschwitz, you hear a lot about Auschwitz because it's one of the few camps that was not destroyed. Uh, there was uh, Treblinka, a camp outside of uh, Warsaw, also close to a million people who died there, but the Russians had something like thousands of camps in their world. Most they destroyed as the, uh, they were losing the war because they didn't want to sh leave evidence of what was happening in those camps. And uh, Auschwitz survived, it's a museum today, so you hear a lot about it, but it also was a, a, the place where more people died than the other. In any case, I went to this room with the archives, and as you walked in, there was a table with pen and paper, and you could write down anybody you're looking for, and I wrote down my father's name. And I went up to the front of the room. The room was maybe about uh, half the size of this auditorium, and uh, 
I wrote my father's name, gave uh, the attendant the paper to a slot there was a glass partition, and I watched her walk back. Both sides and back wall completely filled with shelves and volumes of books this thick. And I watched the attendant go to a book, make a photocopy, and bring me this piece of paper. And on the top it has a number. I assumed the number that my father had tattooed on his forearm. When you came to Auschwitz, everyone had a number tattooed on their forearm. You were no longer a human being, you were another person, you had no name. As the transport number and the date that my father arrived in Auschwitz, April 17, 1942. His name, his address in Slovakia. His date of birth, his parents' names, his mother's names, and the date he died, June 10, 1942. I was 58 years old and I stood there with this piece of paper, and for the first time in my life, I felt the presence of my father. He was somewhere in that place. And I also stood there and I looked at all these volumes of books and all these names and I wondered why. When you kill, when you do terrible things, you don't record it, you don't promote it, you hide it. But I think that Hitler believed that he was doing something great for the world. And he was going to preserve these records as many other records that were preserved to show future generations what a great person he was. As I told you, Czechoslovakia split into Czech Republic and Slovakia in 1992. Well, during World War II, Czechoslovakia also split. And the Slovaks established a separate government supporting Germany. And in 1942, shipped almost their entire Jewish population of about 100,000 to the camps, where something like 90% perished. The German armies came to our part of the world sometime in 1944. And I believe that my mother received word that they were coming towards our village. She took what was left from our family, over 20, from over 25 of us, she and I, my grandmother, her mother, and an aunt and uncle. And we traveled to another village, I assume opposite direction where we were told this, the German soldiers were coming from. So a trip of several days, walking, horse-drawn carts, best way you can travel. It was about 100 miles away. A village sort of like the one I told you I grew up in, as are many of the villages in that part of the world to this day. And we lived there with two families, strangers. So I'm five years old now. And one morning, we're awakened by loud screaming, run, the Germans are here. My mother and I threw on whatever clothes we had handy, and she and I managed to escape to the forest outside the village. No idea about my grandmother and an uncle. I remember eating berries and I guess whatever else we could find. And one day my mother saw the son of the people we'd been staying with out in the open grazing their livestock. And she went and spoke to him. After dark, some of them brought us back to the village. And behind their home, they dug a hole in the ground. I'm talking about four walls of dirt and floor of dirt. Put us in that hole, and that's where we spent the next seven months of the war. The people hiding us when they could, by the way, they covered it with branches from their trees, leaves, manure from their animals. When they could, they would bring us some cold soup, sometimes a piece of bread. In many days, my mother went without because I was crying of cold and hunger. We passed the time, she telling me folk tales, stories. And though I can't remember this, I guess we did a lot of counting because I know when we were freed, I could count to 10,000. I'm still wondering how I didn't become a great mathematician. Good, sometimes people don't laugh, I have to tell them it's a joke. <clears throat> <clears throat> so 
So I want to talk to you about the heroes of my story. These simple peasant farmers who risk their own life to save a human, another human being that they hardly knew. You see, the entire time that we're in hiding, German soldiers are living in their house. The Germans would come to some of those villages and make a center from where to fight. And their camp was not tents. They would move into the homes of the villagers who had to provide them shelter, food, whatever, but they would simply kill them. And you see, if we're discovered, we and the people hiding us are shot on the spot. We for being Jewish, they for sheltering Jews. And I often ask myself, ask yourself, could I do the same? Could I risk my own life to save another human being I hardly know? You know, I don't know if I could be that brave or that courageous. Probably wouldn't know till I was faced with having to make that kind of decision which I hope you or I never will. At Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, they honor who they call the righteous of the nations. Gentiles, Christians, like I am telling you about, who saved others during the war. Not just Jews, I'll tell you later about uh, there was many others involved. Jews and non-Jews. And we've identified over 22,000. And that's a large number. But it's also less than 1% of the population of Europe at that time. And we won't find too many more. Both survivors and those that helped them are getting older and are dying off. The military war against Germany was won by the Allied forces. The moral war was won by the righteous Christians, like I'm telling you about, who basically said, this is not right. We're not going along with the mob, and we're going to do something about it. They were the original, what we call today, and I'll speak about later, the original upstanders. We were freed by Russian troops on April 1, 1945. We emerged from that hole to what sounded like celebration. We'd been in the dark so long we could not open our eyes to the sun right away. When we gained some eyesight, we were taken across the street where another family was hiding my aunt and uncle. No sign of my grandmother. After we regained some strength a few days later, we made a several day trip back to our village. Remember, the war is still going on and ended about a month later. Home was still there and we moved back in. A couple of weeks later, my grandmother showed up. That day, when the Germans came to the village, she was hiding behind a bush and one of the townspeople turned her in. She was sent to concentration camp but thankfully survived. Of the approximately 1,000 Jews in that village, 120 survived. About 90% perished. Of our family from over 27 survived. I was the only Jewish child to survive in that village. You see, of the approximately 6 million Jews killed, about a million and a half were children. The Germans took people to concentration camp, and when you arrived, you went to what they call selection. In one side, dead. On the other side, if you look like you might be able to do some work, you went to work under very difficult conditions, very little food, no shoes in the winter, and when you couldn't work anymore, you were disposed of. But children couldn't work. And mothers would worry about the children. So they were usually killed where found, often buried in mass graves. I was very sick for about a year after the war. I was bedridden pretty much because I had 
I had um, reaction to food, I had malnutrition, and could not eat very well. I got well, started school, and life started over. Czechoslovakia came together as one country again, and the leaders that uh, aided the Germans were tried for treason, and most were executed. In 1948, there was a military coup in Czechoslovakia, a military takeover by communists supported by Russia. And I guess my mother said something like, first the Nazis and now the communists, we need to leave here. It was not easy to leave under communism. It was not also not easy to come to the United States where I had quotas and limitations of how many people could come. But my mother arranged for all of our family that was left to leave. Some went to Australia, some went to Israel, and we were fortunate to come to Los Angeles in 1951. I was 12 years old, and I'm forever grateful for the freedom, the opportunities, and the life I've been fortunate to enjoy. And for a young lady from Millsap, Texas. So now you've heard my story. It's not that important, it's just one of many. And I'm not here really to talk about me. I'm here to really talk about you. This is about you. One of the many reasons we speak about the Holocaust is that we don't want our past to be your future and your children's future. And what I want to speak to you about is a few of the important, of the many lessons from the Holocaust. To this day, as I told you yesterday, you commemorated 70 years liberation of Auschwitz. And to this day, the world is still fascinated. There's still new, a movie just came out, new books, new things. And, and maybe one reason is, as Churchill said, the Holocaust was the greatest crime in human history. And I can tell you that 70 years later, it is still hard for me to believe that something like that could happen in this world. But it did happen. And it happened in 1930s Germany. The last place that you would think something like that would originate. In 1930s Germany, yes, they had their problems. But they were probably the America of the time, if not the most, among the most educated people. Uh, the most advanced in medicine, in science, and technology. A great history of culture. Uh, Beethoven, uh, Wagner, Goethe, Schiller. And these same people killed babies in front of parents and parents in front of babies. And that night, attending the symphony. In 1935, the German people had no idea what their life would be like five years later. And one of the main lessons in the Holocaust is, it shows how quickly civilization can turn to savagery. And I'm not suggesting that something like that could happen here. But what I do suggest is that we cannot take anything for granted. You cannot take your freedom for granted, your family, your home, whatever that you hold dear. You must be aware, you must be educated, you must be active. Do not take anything for granted. Now, one of the things I do want you to know is that when most people think of the Holocaust, they're usually related 
to the approximately six million Jews that were killed. And that's one third of the world's population, Jewish population at that time of 18 million. And even today they've never gained those numbers, they're somewhere over 13 million in the whole world. So the Jews are a very small minority in the world. But it was not only about the Jews, in fact, about 11 million died in the Holocaust, and not including military here. Anybody that opposed Hitler, political opponents, teachers, intellectuals, clergy, or anybody that didn't fit into Hitler's view of the perfect race he was going to establish. Gypsies, uh, people of color, uh, homosexuals, disabled, physically, mentally. In fact, the very first people to die in the Holocaust in 1933 after Hitler took power were the disabled. He called them useless eaters. Useless eaters. They took, but they could not give back. So, we're just killed. We're just killed. How do you kill 11 million people? There are probably a lot of answers, but one of them is you lie. You lie. And then you get yourself elected to office. Hitler was elected in a democratic election. So you see, the main problem was not Hitler and the Nazis. The main problem was the people that would elect such a person to be their leader. Think about that. Now we have a model Never again. Never again. Our idea and hope was to tell our stories, write books, movies, build museums. And the hope was that showing people the terrible things that humans are capable of doing we could prevent such a thing to never happen again. And you see, our efforts are more valid than ever because the world has still not learned. Because never again was a game for several hundred thousand found in the killing fields of Cambodia. And never again was a game just 20 short years ago for about one million killed in Rwanda. And in the last few years, we've had Darfur, the Congo, where some five to 10 million have died in the last few years, and you don't even hear anything about it. And I could cite you more. And how are we to believe that in the 21st century, we'd be watching people chopping other people's heads off or hanging them on TV and the internet? So you see, the lessons of the Holocaust are still to be learned. And our message is more important, it seems, than ever. For me, the main lesson was expressed by Albert Einstein, who said, the world is a dangerous place to live in, not because of those that would do you harm, but because of those that sit and let it happen. We call them bystanders. The Holocaust did not have to happen, except for so many bystanders between the years of 1933 and 1945. They were guilty of a conspiracy of silence, a conspiracy of indifference, doesn't affect me directly, why should I get involved? Why should I say anything? Why should I take any risk? No better example than the Holocaust, why they should have spoken out because eventually they were all involved. Imagine 
How many people had to be silent for something like the Holocaust to happen? So today, we have a program, and we establish a program that we encourage, especially young people, but people in general, to be upstanders rather than bystanders. An upstander, someone who speaks out against hate, prejudice, intolerance, wherever you find it. There's not any good reason in this world that differences in our nationalities, religion, color of our skin should divide us. About 50 years ago when Martin Luther King gave his famous speech in Washington DC called There were many speakers, and the speaker right before Dr. King spoke was a rabbi named a Rabbi Prince. And here's one of the things he said in his talk. When I was the rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under Hitler regime, I learned many things. The most important thing that I learned under those tragic circumstances was that bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problem. The most urgent, the most disgraceful, the most shameful, and the most tragic problem is silence. A great people which had create, created a great civilization had become a nation of silent onlookers. They remained silent in the face of hate, in the face of brutality, and in the face of mass murder. <clears throat> so as I said, there are many lessons from the Holocaust. And I want to tell you a couple more that I found so important. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist in Vienna, Jewish. All his family were taken to concentration camp. He survived. Right after the war, he wrote his famous book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he wrote it not as from the standpoint about himself, but as a psychiatrist observing how people reacted in these very difficult situations and conditions. And one of the things he wrote was this. A few of the guards were decent fellows. And I guess what he meant that a few of the guards had risked themselves trying to make things a little easier for the people interned there. And he said, this taught me one thing. There are only two races in the world. The race of the decent human being and the race of the not decent human being. He didn't look at these guards as Nazis, Germans, whatever. He judged them by their actions, by their behavior. And today when we talk so much about diversity and tolerance, for me, what Franco wrote is what we really should strive for. Not see differences, but see actions. How people, how human beings, He also wrote about the people in prison there. And lost everything, their homes, seeing their children, families murdered, gold teeth pulled to make our, uh, gold bars to aid the German war effort. And he said there's one thing that nobody could take away from them. He called it the last freedom. The freedom how you choose
to react in any particular situation. He said, things will happen to you as you go through life that you have no control over. What is important is how you react. He called it the power to choose. The power to choose. And you know what? All of you, every person in this room in the world has the same amazing power. The power to choose. You have the power to choose to come to school every day and do the very best you can and to do 1% better tomorrow. You have the power to choose to be a role model for others by how you act, how you behave. And you have the amazing power to be the one in the room to stand up and speak out, even if it's not the most popular thing to do. And you have the power to choose to leave here today an upstander, rather than a bystander. And I want to say one thing that's also, besides diversity, is about tolerance, what the Holocaust teaches about tolerance. The Holocaust is not just answers, as I said, it's many questions. And what are the questions? And it teaches us to think about this. It's great. Tolerance is a very noble endeavor. But the Holocaust asked the question, are you going to be tolerant of the intolerant? I think some of you have read Night in your schooling. Uh, written by Elie Wiesel, it's his story. I don't know if you know, but Elie Wiesel is more than a Holocaust survivor. He is one of the great humanitarians in the world, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, a brilliant man. Today in his middle eighties, he's still traveling around the world, speaking on, the, on behalf of the oppressed. And he wrote uh, about meeting Anne Frank's father at an exhibition in Paris. And he wrote about the world was busy fighting a war. But what the world did not see, they were killing off potential future Nobel Prize winners. Who knows, but that one of these children might not have found a cure for cancer or heart disease. One might have solved the world's hunger problems. Some composed beautiful music or written great literature. And one, one might have written words that would eradicate hate from the human heart. But then Anne did write such words, and hate is still with us today. And I want to say this to you. I've been fortunate to work, travel, and live around the world several times over. And what I want to tell you is that you live still in one of the few countries in the world where you can be anything you want to be and every one of you has a chance for an education. And you in this room have the chance that those children never got. Don't let it pass you by. Don't miss that opportunity. Don't regret it later. And it's strictly up to you. You have to take responsibility for yourself. Oh, we read about our schools need this, and our teachers are dead, and what have you know. I don't buy it. Maybe they're not perfect, but it's the best there is. When people from all the world have a chance to study, where do they go? Right here. Where? Yes. Boy, you understand me, just yeah. That's right. It's still the dream of most of the world to come to America, even with whatever problems you think we may have. So take responsibility for yourself. 
You know when uh, Elie Wiesel wrote they were killing off potential future Nobel Prize winners? He has statistics to support what he's saying. Jews represent less than one-fifth of one percent of the world's population. They are about 23 percent of Nobel Prize winners. It's on the internet, you can look it up. <laughs> Education is, is very much a Jewish value. Uh, goes back all the way to their Bible, you call the Old Testament, you just call the Torah, where it says parents have the responsibility to prepare their children for life. And one of the great rabbis interpreted that to say, how do you best prepare them for life? You educate them. And a rabbi in the year 65 made study mandatory for Jewish children. There were a thousand years before any other society. And today, I believe that one of the main reasons Jews have survived, you know, after most of them were dispersed by the Romans from their ancient homeland in Israel, they became a very small minority everywhere around the world. They were too small to fight back physically, but they discovered they could fall back with education. I was just reading last week about Jews in this country. They're one and a half percent of the population. 35% have higher degrees, graduate degrees. And Jewish mothers are notorious for bugging their kids to study. But you know what? You don't have to be Jewish to be a Jewish mother. My Christian wife bugged our son so much every day that he came home from school. I was feeling sorry for it. <laughs> That's the truth. And he has a higher degree. We're not sure if he's Jewish or Christian to this day, but I guess one day we'll find out. But he's a great person. Um, so let me end with this. And I think uh, someone can tell me I'm glad to take a few questions if we have time. The tragedy is not only that we lost all those people, and we lost all those children. But we will never know what they might have done for the betterment of this world. And as I told you, the Holocaust asks a lot of questions. And I would like you to leave here today and ask yourself this question. What would I have done? And more important, what will I do? Thank you very much.